Yeah. There we go. Now it's official. Now it's official. <laughs> Uh, welcome everyone and thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Alex Johnson. I'm an adjunct professor in philosophy at SUNY Purchase. Um, I'm also an inaugural member of the Feminist Press's Young Feminist Leaders Council. Uh, we are a volunteer group of young feminist professionals dedicated to the feminist press, uh, press mission to change the world through feminist literature and diverse storytelling. We're so glad to have you all here today um, at this panel about the debut author experience. We have Feminist Press Senior Editor, um, and interim executive director, Lauren Hook, joining us today, and three FB authors, YZ Chin, author of the short story collection, uh, Though I Get Home from Feminist Press, and the novel, novel Edge Case from Echo, Cassandra Lane, author of the memoir, We Are Bridges from Feminist Press, and Megan Milks, author of several books, including the novel Margaret and Mystery of the Missing Body and the short story collection Slug and Other Stories out today from FP. Congratulations. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> so we'll have each of our panelists just introduce themselves briefly. So would each of you give us some insight into your background, how you came into writing, and how you got your first book out into the world? Um, we can start with YZ, and then we'll go to Cassandra and Megan. Sure. <laughs> thanks, Alex, and um, thanks, Feminist Press, for having me. Um, really happy to be sharing my experience here. Um, so I was born and raised in Taipei, Malaysia, which is half the world away. Um, I came to the US for college and um, before coming for college, I was interested in writing, um, but in college, I had a scholarship to study um, something practical. So I was actually in the School of Engineering, uh, majoring in computer science, um, but then I sort of snuck in the creative writing minor um, and it was it was useful. It was um, I, I didn't have any knowledge or experience of workshops and MFA programs and the like, but the undergrad writing program was sort of run like, um, you know, it uses the MFA workshop format. So um, that was a real shocker and also, I think, really useful experience um, at the same time. Matt had a really good cohort, really great teachers, um, learned a lot. And then uh, after I graduated, I wanted to keep writing, um, but because I am an immigrant. So um, I know like there's sort of this um, maybe sort of stereotypical writer journey that you might come across, which is, uh, you know, just work the um, work the least amount you can, like save all your brain juice and time and energy for writing. Um, so I sort of fell hard for that, <laughs> um, for that vision, but um, Unfortunately, as an immigrant, I needed a work visa to continue staying in America. So that that vision was not really a possibility for me. Um, so I created my my own vision, which is uh, even though I had a degree in engineering, I, I took a, a bunch of sort of unrelated jobs, um, jobs outside of computer science. Um, they were full time jobs because in order to secure the work visa, you have to work at least 40 hours a week. Um, so I worked in a law firm and in a uh, fintech, which is financial tech uh, startup, um, doing various, playing various roles. Um, and I would then write at night and on weekends. Um, and then, you know, kept at it for, for years and then very luckily um, came across the feminist press call for um, a inaugural prize. It was the first year the Louise, Mer the Louise Merriweather first book prize was being held. And um, I had wanted to write a novel. I really wanted to write a novel. I don't, I don't know why everyone wants to write a novel when they're young, perhaps. And uh, couldn't, just couldn't manage it with the, you know, a few hours scrapped together at night and on weekends. So I decided that uh, a short story collection made more sense since I was writing in short chunks and little bursts like that. Um, so I sort of broke my novel apart and um, turned it into a linked story collection, um, which I then submitted to Feminist Press for the Louise Merriweather First Book Prize. And yeah, very happily, very luckily, uh, was selected. The book was selected to be published, and um, my editor, I worked with Lauren right here. 
Um, and it was it was a really good eye opening, great experience. I knew absolutely nothing about publishing going in. Um, what I learned, I learned a lot from Lauren, um, Jisoo, Lucia, and others at Feminist Press. Um, so that's that's my story. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, Cassandra, same questions to you. Yeah, thank you, Wysen, that's so fascinating. Um, and thank you, Feminist Press. This, this panel is something that I wish I would have had um, as a young aspiring writer. And I'm just so thankful that you're doing this, you know, for people and, and for us too, because we're continuing to learn. I grew up in Louisiana. Um, poor, but full of dreams. And I told my mom around 10 or 11 that I would be a writer, that I wanted to write books because I loved reading so much. I loved watching her read. I think that's how I fell in love with writing, just watching her read her romance novels and just her feet shaking. <laughs> and I, I sensed, I think that that was gonna be my main form of communication because I didn't talk, I was super timid. Um, but I didn't know any writers, there was no, clear pathway. There was no pathway at all, but I did have one older cousin who had gone to college. I'm the only other person in the family who um, went to college and he majored in photojournalism. And I thought, I know that this school has a journalism program. I'll major in print. It's the only school that I applied to. Um, Cause it just, again, didn't know any better. And it was just following this one person who was my, my, my light. Um, he, I did my internship at the first uh, newspaper where he worked. I decided to, my second newspaper job was the second newspaper where he worked. So again, I just think it's so important that we have these models, that we have um, these pathways and he was mine. And I found my way within that with his support, um, some of the, the contacts that he made for me. And, but I was still afraid to, you know, I wanted to major in, in English literature and creative writing, but being really practical, wanting to have some money to put food on the table, I did know that, you know, which I wasn't necessarily gonna make a living um, as a writer, so, or as a novelist. Um, so I majored in journalism. That was my quote unquote backup. And I minored in English literature and took so many classes because that was the most exciting part to me that I almost did a double major. And they tried to convince me to stay an extra semester to do that, but I was so tired by that point. Um, I became the editor in chief of the campus newspaper, which again, I was pushed to do um, by my journalism teachers. And um, I did an internship at the local newspaper and at the local radio, one of the local radio stations. And it was just really good training ground but all along I knew that I wanted that I was a creative writer and that that's what I would that's where my dreams were but I got caught up in journalism um, long hours I actually don't regret it because it was it was wonderful to meet so many people pushing me out of my shell um, doing so many different types of stories um, but at some point I knew that I needed to recommit to my earlier dream and I left the newsroom full time, started freelancing to give myself a little bit more flexibility, applied to an MFA program here in Los Angeles. And that's what brought me from Louisiana to Los Angeles. Um, as well, my ex-husband, we were both journalists, he got a job here in LA at, at, a at Associated Press. Um, I did the two year program, which was amazing because I was able to just focus on writing. I didn't have to work full time. That was the beginnings of the book that um, Feminist Press eventually published. That was 20 years in the making, kind of off and on. I totally can relate to you, YZ. You know, I've worked full time in very demanding jobs and just had little pieces here and there. I can't stay up late, so just early in the mornings, um, a little bit on the weekends. And then when I became a mom, it became even more challenging, but I think it also pushed me and I became more determined um, around 2017 is when I felt like the book was starting to take a better shape. I really struggled with structure. Um, and, you know, I, I, all along I had, after I left the newsroom, I was really building creative writing community. I joined a writing workshop in New Orleans. Um, beautiful, wonderful poets and writers. Jericho Brown was in that workshop. Tamika Kay, Jonah Harvey, um, Terrence. 
all of these wonderful writers who, you know, that's that's one thing that we really need to be cognizant of is building our community, getting feedback on our work. And so I was doing that all along and that continued out here in LA. Um, but yeah, just, a, 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 just really looking in 2017, 2018, that this needs to get published. I need the support to do that. Um, I think in 2019, early 2019, I sent it off to one book contest and just forgot about it. It was a runner up. That was very encouraging. The judge reached out to me personally. I found out about the feminist press contest and um, sent it off again, kept revising, kept writing, not expecting anything and was just so overwhelmed with joy when I was the finalist and then um, the winner and the rest was history. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, Megan, same questions. Sure. Yeah. Um, I love, I'm loving hearing these uh, background stories and just, you know, the different paths we've taken. Um, for me, uh, I, uh, in some ways, I guess I took a more straightforward route. Um, I, um, well, yes and no, I guess. But um, I, when I was in college, I also like, knew I wanted to be a creative writer, um, knew I wanted to do that, didn't, wasn't really able to trust that or pursue that because my parents put a lot of pressure on me to like do like a practical major. So, well, first I majored in math, which I suppose is not that practical, but, um, uh, but then yeah, I transferred schools and then um, was double majoring in cognitive science and, um, and English and um, spent a lot of time like in a neuroscience lab um, for three years, um, pursuing, uh, you know, a potential career in neuroscience, which is just like really bewildering now to, to think back on. Um, but anyway, but during that time, I was also, uh, writing and editing for the campus newspaper, um, the arts and entertainment section was doing like music reviews mostly. And, um, and then after college, I spent a few years, like trying to pursue a career in journalism as well. Um, which was, um, you know, al already starting to decline, you know, as a as a profession. Um, so uh, it, yeah, it quickly be became clear to me that like my future in that world was, you know, precarious. So um, I ended up um, just yeah pursuing um, a graduate program in creative writing. Um, and part of the story behind that is that. Um, in one of my creative writing workshops in college, I met up with a, a person, um, a continuing ed student who um, uh, became a very good friend of mine. And so after that workshop ended, um, she and I began trading work and we had, and we like created like writing groups together um, in Charlottesville where we were. Um, and I learned a lot from her, you know, like she read Poets and Writers magazine and so it would give me her like older copies and and that was just like my way of like understanding that there was like a professional world of creative writing that I could um, try to access. Um, and she was, you know, exploring um, MFA programs, um, which I like, I didn't know what an MFA was, you know? Um, so it was through her that I kind of like understood that there was this other path and I watched her go on it and she got into an MFA program. And then I was like, oh, you know, I could actually do that too. Um, I didn't actually pursue a, an MFA. The program I got into was a master's program in literature and creative writing. And from there, I went on to pursue a PhD. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know. I was publishing um, short stories here and there. Um, and uh, like, I really needed a push from my advisor to be like, you know, you, you could you could put together a book. You could put together a collection. It just like hadn't occurred to me that I could do that. Um, and so uh, I ended up doing that and, um, and uh, like he connected me with um, Brian at Emergency Press who actually put out the first edition of, of um, what, would, what is now Slug but was Kill Marguerite um, at that time. And that was in 2014. And then, so, so my, my debut actually happened in 2014, I suppose, but it was such a small uh, it was on such a small scale and I was so socially isolated at that time. I was living in rural Illinois, um, doing like a visiting, visiting associate, visiting assistant professor teaching gig. Um, uh, it's been really wonderful to have this kind of like second shot at being a debut 
author um, through Feminist Press with a, a little bit more fanfare and much more support. So that has really been wonderful. But yeah, in the intervening years between 2014 and, and now, um, yeah, I just had to really make a lot of decisions about like how I wanted to structure my life in order to, to support writing um, versus like academic, um, you know, teaching. Um, and so I ended up deciding to move to New York um, and uh, a friend um, put me in touch with um, his agent uh, who ended up becoming my agent. Um, and that was just like, again, like something I never thought I would have because my work is, at least I thought my work was so like marginal and um, only relevant to like a very small, a very tiny community of people. Um, that like I really needed somebody to say like this this could be something you could pursue um and so yeah so for me a lot of it has just been like seeing other people um and their paths and and uh and uh you know following their their models Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you all so much. We're so happy to have you here. Um, I was going to kick off the panel with one question, but sort of listening to all of the threads that that really connect you all, I think I want to kick off with a different one. Um, you all mentioned communities. You all mentioned workshops. You all mentioned individuals, people that you've sort of followed or people that sort of helped you on your way. Um, are there communities that you joined um, that you would recommend to incoming writers or are there ways that you would recommend to new writers to build their community um, and how important obviously it seems like it was extremely important um, but how important would you recommend that to um, new and, and incoming authors and this is for all of you i'd love to hear from all of you yeah You know, if we wanted to keep it the same order, I'll go. Um, yeah, I would say number, it's number two in, in terms of importance level, you know, after writing and revising, um, because you need, you know, it's such a, this country especially still doesn't treat its artists and writers the way it should. Um, and so you need, first of all, just that support, that moral, emotional, spiritual support. Um, so joining workshops so that you can get other eyes on your on your work um, so that you can be introduced to different types of writers, whether it's the writers in the workshop or the books that they're reading. Um, that is so crucial um, hearing them read their work and and all these different textures in terms of voice will help you find your own. Um, and then when you start, you know, growing as a writer looking at groups that are uh, and, and people who are not only writing for in privately, but getting their work out there uh, here in Los Angeles. And, and really it's now national um, and pretty much everything now can be global because we have these virtual spaces that we weren't taking advantage of. But Women Who Submit, um, which is a nonprofit group that supports women and non-binary writers in publishing, sending their work out and especially sending their work out to top tier um, publications because that was one of the, you know, one of the excuses was that not, uh, not enough women are, are submitting to these top tier publications. And so women who submit formed saying, we're gonna do something about this. We're gonna support women and non-binary writers and sending their work out. Um, and not just top tier, but certainly that's why not. Um, and that's just a group that's grown locally from, from this local small group of local um, writers to there are now chapters in Florida and New Jersey. Um, people meet virtually and continue like it pivoted right away when the pandemic hit. Um, and we cheer each other on when we say, and off, you know, work, whether it's uh, to a contest or an individual piece, you know, to, to an anthology or even a letter to the editor. Um, so there's a bell and there's cheers. Um, and then there's also a rejection brag that um, the women who submit face private Facebook group, you know, puts out each month so that, you know, taking out the just seamless to find the whole process and saying, I got rejected from X, Y, Z, you know, and inevitably some other writer will say, I got rejected from them too. And, you know, there's, it just takes the shame, the pressure out of it. Um, so that's one group for sure that I would recommend. Um, yeah, I 
also wanted to say that, you know, don't be afraid of, of going to literary events or parties by yourself, <laughs> because that's um, one one way I um, met like a someone I consider um, like a mentor figure. So um, I used to go to a lot to the Asian American Writers Workshop um, readings. Um, they do they have really great programming um, lived in New York. Um, I lived in Manhattan at the time and I would go after work after my day job. Um, it wasn't that far and it would um, often go by myself, but then sort of try to strike up conversations uh, with people. Um, so I remember at one event, um, I listened to the Singaporean writer and translator Jeremy Tiang um, read from his linked story collection um, and his story collection um, featured government um, censorship and oppression um, and sort of arrests of um, actors in the communist movement at the time. I, I don't want to go too deep down the rabbit hole. Anyway, it had, uh, I, I sort of saw little echoes um, in, in terms of themes in his work and my work. Um, so then later, I coincidentally uh, ran into him at a Pan America event. And um, I just struck up a conversation with him and spoke about how how much I enjoyed his reading and his work. Um, and that sort of led to him really explaining a lot about the world of literary, literary translation, which I knew nothing about at the time. Um, and thanks to his encouragement, encouragement from other translators like Mui Pupok Seko, um, I <laughs> actually did just did not too long ago finish translating um, my first novel from Chinese, Li Zi Shu's The Age of Goodbyes, which is forthcoming from Feminist Press. Um, so yeah, I would say community happens online, but also um, in real life, you can really just go strike up conversations with writers you admire. Um, and sometimes good things happen. Um, yeah, when, when Though I Get Home came out, I was still on Facebook, I'm no longer on Facebook, I was still on Facebook then, and I joined this uh, Facebook group for debut authors, and that's where I also um, formed a connection with Ivelisse Rodriguez, uh, Love War Stories, also from Feminist Press, um, and then we later did an AWP panel together, um, so I would say my ways of finding community are a little haphazard, but I think they, they work for me. Um, I don't really have like a neat approach. I just sort of, you know, go to readings, go to events, um, join certain spaces. If that's something uh, that works for you, consider that. Um, I'm, I'm by no means an extrovert, so it's not super fun to like approach someone you don't know at a party and talk to them. Um, but I think it helps when I I consider it as, um, you know, I'm really approaching a writer to talk about their writing as a professional, serious inquiry. I'm not, you know, I'm not there to make small talk. I think that that helps me um, get over the sense that I'm imposing. Um, if I think about this sort of like an artistic, you know, a conversation about uh, art, conversation about um, the literary world. Yeah, that, that helps me get over my fear of socialization <laughs> yeah um ditto from me i i'm less shy than i used to be but i used to be very 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 shy and reserved and but i was also very hungry for community um so one of my strategies was to um to um, make projects and try to get people to do projects with me. Um, so I, I created a zine. Um, my friend John and I created this. It was really a magazine, but it was technically a zine since there weren't ads and it sounded cooler. Um, so, and that would be an, a, an excuse to like reach out to people and, you know, um, suggest interviews or I would, you know, cover their work in some way. Um, and that would be my way of um, kind of approaching them as potential friends, really. Um, and then, yeah, I've also like really benefited from writing groups. Um, uh, yeah, I can't, as um, Cassandra mentioned, yeah, like writing groups are so important um, to, uh, for at least, yeah, for me. Um, 
getting those, having deadlines and accountability and just also um, having an opportunity to revel and in progress work and have writerly conversations that are very, um, you know, kind of cozy and intimate. And um, yeah, I've been in so many wonderful writing groups that have um, improved my writing so much. Wonderful. So we have sort of advice towards writing groups. It's like central advice. I think that's fantastic. Um, in literary events, um, and Cassandra, you mentioned women who submit. So I just wanted to reiterate that. So we sort of have that at the top of the list. Um, another thread that kind of went through that whole conversation was this idea of shyness, which I thought was really interesting because you all said it. Um, and it kind of um, pushes me into my question about imposter syndrome. Um, it's a feminist issue. And so when did you start calling yourself a writer? And if, if you haven't, <laughs> if you've gotten past imposter syndrome, if you've gotten, if you have techniques, I guess, of like moving past that, I think we'd love to hear that too. Uh, I think for, this is going to sound like a joke, but it's, it's 90% not. <laughs> I think for me, it was a little easier for me to call myself a writer. Um, because I think maybe um, in, I don't know, your stereotypical Malaysian, um, you know, family at least, like, I don't think being a writer is considered <laughs> super glamorous or prestigious. Um, so I think the hurdle to overcome for me might have been a little less. Um, I think it's, it's easier to um, so in, in fact, you, you have to gear yourself up to say I'm a writer and potentially meet opposition, um, you know, from like, just like expectations, societal expectations for what is or is not a fulfilling <laughs> career. Um, so yeah, I think claiming, claiming that title um, was, was not, not too hard at first, um, but I think what I struggled with was, uh, you know, imagining myself um, back when I was not published of one day being a published author I think author um, like with, with a book like a physical book that was really hard uh, for me to envision um, something that helped is um, and I know a lot of writers quote this um, this this is how you know it really does work for many people um, is something um, Alexander Chi said which is you go into a bookstore and you go to the shelf and you place your finger, you know, between the two books where your book might one day go. <laughs> and you just, you know, sit in that moment a little. Um, it's like, it's, it's fuel. Um, and yeah, I used to go into bookstores a lot and look at all these new books coming out and, you know, think about what my book might one day look like. Um, so yeah, I think I think claiming writing was easy. I think considering the leap to being published author um, was hard, but I think there are a lot of um, quote unquote established authors uh, who are generous about sharing their journeys from unpublished to published. Um, and, you know, not to say, of course, that um, that journey is, is guaranteed, but I think it's helpful um, to see yeah, it's helpful helpful to see someone navigate that mental space, if not like the practical steps um, of of going from unpublished to published. So yeah, the mental the mental steps of like yeah, <laughs> sorry, I'll stop there. Yeah, the mental steps of like placing your finger where in the space where your book might one day be. I think uh, things like that are as important are as important as considering the practical uh, process. Well, I first called myself a writer, I think at 10 or 11, after my mom got me that first journal with the lock and the key. Um, and I was writing, right? So I was a writer. <laughs> and so I think that's important. You know, I'm, I'm a writer because I'm doing the act of writing. Um, but I also think that seeing my mother, who's a, a guitarist, um, even though she worked, you know, low paying, federal jobs, um, she, on, to me, she was, she was this gifted guitarist and she practiced, you know, when she could um, on weekends, she played in all kinds of revivals and church services and we're so proud sitting there in the audience cheering her on. 
Um, and she came up, up against opposition in our small town. She was like the only woman playing the electric guitar in a lot of these um, groups. There was a lot of like competition and, you know, taking, trying to take her down a notch. And I think just growing up and seeing that and just seeing her fierceness and determination despite all of that, that fueled me. Um, so definitely imposter syndrome is something that constantly comes up as first a woman and also a black woman in this country. Um, but it just it just creates the fiction and fight that I need to keep going. Um, I think you know being hired by newspapers and seeing my name and then under that under that staff writer you know gives you that acceptable um, affirmation in the community. Oh yes, you're a writer because I saw your name in the, in the newspaper. But again, I still saw myself as a published author one day that that's what I was gonna do. And I think going back to community, surrounding myself um, with not only aspiring writers, but so many of those writers went on to publish, my mentors were published. Um, and so I just had this feeling inside me, I'm gonna publish a book, I'm gonna publish books because that's who I am and that's who I, you know, those people are my um, reflections. And uh, there was just no doubt that one day it would happen. And I don't, I don't even know that I was necessarily in a rush, but it was just this feeling of deep knowing that it would happen and hopefully that it will continue to happen. And, and accepting that imposter syndrome is something that we have to continually fight, um, not because, not necessarily that it's, you know, something that we're born with, but because that's, that's the kind of community uh, or world that we live in. And that just makes me want to fight more. Yeah, I love that. I love both of these responses. Um, yeah, and I think what what YZ said about writer versus author really resonated with me because I I too I I haven't really had a problem calling myself a writer. In some ways, it's been a lot easier for me to be a writer than to be like a full person in life. Um, but but there is a difference between like being a writer, and I guess there's something like a there's something like modest about the word writer versus like author versus like even artist, um, which I feel like is coming up with um, uh, Cassandra, your mother being, um, you know, this like publicly known artist. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, so I didn't have any problem like claiming writer because it's just like, you know, here I am scribbling away, you know, these are my, these are my ideas. Um, but, uh, but yeah, imagining getting to that next stage of like being recognized as an author, um, was a very different thing. And I feel like I've had to have people tell me like, you know, th this path is available to you, you know, like you can take these steps, um, in order to do that. Um, and then also I think, um, the other struggle has been um, claiming uh, the category of artist um, and, and kind of taking myself seriously and taking my work seriously as art. Um, and that's something I'm just like continually pushing myself to do. Now I'm, you know, in New York surrounded by artists who are doing that work and it's always a struggle for, you know, pretty much everyone I know who is a creative um, person. Um, but yeah, like my New Year's resolutions are always like, number one, take yourself seriously as an artist, you know, give yourself the time, give yourself the validation or affirmation or whatever it is, whatever it is um, that I need at that point. Um, so, so yeah, I'm sort of like constantly trying to do that work. Yeah, I mean, I think that what resonates between the three of you really is this idea of just, um, emotional steps, right? Emotional steps towards like believing in yourself and then allowing other people to do the same thing. Um, YZ, I love the idea of the, you know, standing at the bookshelf and, and where your name is. I mean, that's, I think that's actually absolutely stunning. Um, if I was a painter, I feel like I would paint that. Um, I, it's beautiful. Um, but it, just in terms of the idea of steps and stages and sort of like thinking about your writing and your work it's in stages, um, what would you, suggest pragmatically you know we've had a lot of um ideas about the emotions behind it because you know we're writers and authors and, and artists but just pragmatic steps for people that are coming into the publishing industry industry to say what comes next or how to come into the publishing industry things that you wish you would have known 
um, before you got started or even at any point of those stages along your career? And again, this is for everyone. I think um, that there are so many different places. I mean, of course now everybody has, um, we're all online, but I think when I first came into writing, I didn't realize that there were so many different publications, small, medium, large, um, you know, off the cuff, um, unique, just so many different possible homes for your work. Uh, and so just now there's really, now we're just overwhelmed with information, right? But making sure that you're part of, of groups, um, whether that's online or in person, um, signing up for so many different um, newsletters so that you're looking and researching all of these different publications uh, and reading them to see what the voice is and what type of work they publish. Um, and then once you have your polished pieces, sending them out. I mean, it's just like, you can't write a novel without writing, you know, cha a chapter. You can't write a chapter without writing a paragraph and, and on and on, same thing with publishing. So you can publish flash poems, flash essays. And I just think that just, it's reaffirming. You're getting, you know, bylines out there. You're sharing your work. And it's just um, wonderful to, to start seeing those publication credits pile up. Um, because they will, despite the rejections, the rejections are going to come, but eventually you're going to start publishing, you know, pieces here and here and there. And it just, again, gives you that, that validation that, yes, I'm a writer and I'm not writing just for myself, I'm writing for an audience. I uh, just to echo what Cassandra said, yes, there's, it's absolutely wonderful how how diverse, yeah, the um, publishing landscape is in in the United States. Um, I think, yeah, coming coming from Malaysia, uh, where be, before my my very very absolute first publication was with um, an indie bookstore actually in Malaysia um, that also runs like a side publishing arm. Um, so and and of course growing up. In Malaysia, you sort of have the feeling that, you know, <laughs> the penguin random houses of the world are, are not for you. Um, so I think that um, was actually really helpful in um, helping me discover early on the, like how, just how diverse, um, like just how many publishing outlets there are um, globally. And there, yeah, there are a lot of opportunities. Um, people really do, a lot of good people do care about and want to support writers um, in writing. Um, so I think it's, I think it was, um, it, it was important for me to not uh, just like limit myself to certain things, like so, sort of going back to how I decided I couldn't write a novel with what little time I had and I broke it apart. I think, yeah, not being completely stuck on your one idea of how your publishing journey should look, I think is really helpful um, and practical, even though, yeah, it's still like, you know, mental, mental work. Um, and yeah, and then there's, of course, the practical um, work you, you have to do that you get to do of um, learning what sort of publishing outlets are there, finding the ones that really resonate with you in your work. Um, and then I would say, for me, a very practical um, mindset that I acquired when uh, I entered, I became a published author was, um, you know, you have to realize just how collaborative publishing a book really is. Um, and the, or, like, I think the sooner in the, pro the writing process, well, not too soon. First, of course, you have to write for yourself, create the work, but then you have to understand that um, in order for your book to become um, something that meets the world, finds readers. It's a very, very collaborative process. You have editors, you have designers. Um, and I think it's important to get um, early, early readers, um, get early eyes on your manuscript um, before you officially submit it into the wild, um, just because it helps prepare you for ultimately when you do publish, like just how much um, yeah, how much 
I don't want to say give and take. What's what's a different phrase? <laughs> Just how much um, calibration, right, of of your work um, there has to be in order for not not like a compromise, but for you to communicate what you really want to communicate with your readers. Like, there's just um, ways to see your work and get your message across. Um, like there, there are like better and worse ways of getting your message across that sometimes you just can't see all by yourself. Um. Yeah, I guess, um, right, there are just so many different um, paths to take. It's, um, uh, yeah, it can be overwhelming, I suppose. Um, some pragmatic advice that I can share is, um, uh, well, first, if you, if you feel like you can't find a home for your writing, it's probably not true, but um, but you can also just make your own home for it. You know, self-publishing is always uh, I'm, like my first publications were published in um, this zine I, I co-edited with um, my friend John. Um, and yeah, like I, I co-created a, a reading series in Chicago also to kind of um, create community. Um, in other words, like you can make your own communities and you can, you know, you can find people that way. But anyway, so we're talking more about publishing though. Um, yeah, I think like the main thing that I wish I had known, um, that I wish I would have known um, going into it is just like how much, how much waiting there will be. There's just so much waiting um, from submission to decision, you know, for short stories getting published. Um, and it just gets worse and worse, you know, the, the bigger the manuscript is. Um, and uh, the thing that has helped me the most, because I get, you know, there's like always anxiety when, when you're like waiting to hear about something. Um, I just try to like push that anxiety into writing new work um, and kind of like channel it, put that energy, to, to put that energy somewhere to be generating stuff. Um, so that's been, um, that's been really helpful for me. I wanted to chime in quickly. Yes. Alex, I was going to ask you to, yes. <laughs> so please do. <laughs> uh, I feel like we've been talking a lot about how, you know, why, you know, how many options there are for publishing houses. I mean, even within the U.S., we, we mentioned finding homes for our work. And so I think this is just to say that, you know, it's, it's an interview process both ways. You know, you're pitching your work widely, but you also need to find the, the perfect home for your work, the house that could, you know, is the best champion for your work. And that also goes goes for like the editor you'll be working with. Like you really wanna make sure that that editor hears you, hears your vision, sees your work, right? And doesn't wanna take it in a way that you don't want it to go, right? You wanna like have some trust there. You wanna be able to, you know, work together really closely on the work and like from the same place, not of a place of like too much push or pull. You wanna like be validated with, you know, your own vision. And so I think early on, like publishers are thinking that way too. They're like, can we publish this work? At Feminist Press, we only do 12 to 15 books a year, and there are so many incredible manuscripts, and we just can't publish them all. Uh, and there's so many amazing things also that are, you know, for color and, you know, beautiful publications that we, you know, we just couldn't pull off as a nonprofit. So I think we even pass on works that we deeply admire and, and deeply respect. So we, we think as a publisher, what could we really springboard and champion and do well to our authors proud? So it's going both ways when you're, you know, pitching, think about, who are these people? Do they do they acknowledge my vision? Do they care about it? <laughs> Have they done books that are similar? And how could they best champion my work? And who's going to be working most closely with me? So ask these questions too. It's like it's like dating, right? <laughs> Fantastic! Thank you so much for jumping in, Lauren. Um, I was hoping that you would do that. <laughs> so I'm glad. Um, we have about 15 minutes left, so I'm going to switch to the Q and A. We have a few questions um, in the chat. Um, so. I think I just click into live. Um, so the first question is, how do you decide who you can trust with your work, especially when you join writer groups? Um, the attendee has a hard time trusting strangers with their work, um, not so much in terms of what they can help them with, but more in terms of people who could trust not to steal or copy their work. Yes. 
So any thoughts on trust? Yeah. Yeah, I think, I don't know. I just, I, I don't remember having that fear. I understand it though. Um, I, I think that we, you know, we trust ourselves. So just trusting your own spidey senses, your own intuition, um, whatever homework you can do before you consider joining. I mean, and this, you don't have to join a group before you, in most cases, before you go check it out. So you could, you know, go to a workshop um, that's open anyway and just check it out and see how you feel. Um, talk to writers about their experiences. Um, I think as you as you get to know more writers, I'm trying to go back to because I've been doing workshops for 25 years now, but I'm trying to go back to when I first, yeah, so I'll go back to when I first joined and try to get in touch with the feelings that I had. So I had been in the newsroom, you know, around all these other journalists. Um, and when I found out about this creative writing workshop in New Orleans, um, I was nervous, you know, because I was so excited about it. Um, it was the kind of writing that I really wanted to do. Um, but, and there certainly were a, a couple of energies in the workshop that, uh, that weren't my, my, my jam, but it was really such a positive experience overall. Um, and you just gravitate towards those people who are very um, supportive, listen to how people are responding to other people's work. Maybe you don't share your work right away. Maybe those first few times you go to workshop, you're just listening and reading and giving feedback, um, you know, and deciding whether or not you want to share and, and then sharing slowly little pieces here and there. Um, and, and you can always within a, a larger workshop kind of often partner, you know, if there's somebody that you really vibe with partner partnering with the person I've done that too. Um, where we kind of had our own little thing on the side, you know, for accountability. I remember with one writer, we uh, were both were both moms, and she admired how I was able to get up at four four thirty in the morning because I just trained myself to do that. And she wanted to jump on that too because you know after seven the kids are up and it's a wash and you've got to go to work or whatever. Um, so we decided that we would send each other these daily texts. Are you up? Um, and just really writing together um, and then sending each other work. But that's just, you know, that, that happened over time as I got to fill out different people in the group. And you just naturally will start gravitating towards each other. If there is some sort of, if you do feel like you've been violated or any, in any way, um, I have had work that, that was taken from me uh, without my permission and turned into something else like lines and I just confronted the writer, like, why you didn't ask me? We didn't discuss this. And you're like already sending it off to, it was a chat book. Like, why, why didn't you, if you didn't think something was wrong with it, why didn't you ask me for permission? So that if this is like a true collaboration, but no, we were working together on our own work and you decided to take the, this essay. And it was just, it was just strange, but I confronted him about it and he didn't publish, he took that out. Um, but that's in 25 years, that's only happened once. So I think overwhelmingly people are there to improve their work, to get support, to support you. Um, and it's just a matter of self-trust, listening to your gut um, and, and gravitating towards the people who, who feel like family. I don't have a personal experience with this, um, but just like just to add on to what Cassandra said, um, maybe it's useful to find people um, that you like, like observe how people read and find the readers you like versus the writers you like, um, or you know find find people uh, whose reading insights um, make sense to you, seem helpful or useful to you uh, rather than focusing on um, the writing per se and also perhaps you know cross genre collaborations might be useful you could uh, and I have worked with poets and uh, memoirists um, and yeah maybe that will help you know take the edge of, of yeah I understand how like feelings can uh, run pretty hot when you're sharing something so personal um, so maybe cross-genre co collaboration could be a way um, 
for for you to um yeah feel feel like you you are helping each other more so than cannibalizing each other's work Wait, Megan, did you want to add it all or? Okay. Um, so we have almost done. So uh, we have some general congratulations and happy publication days, Megan. Um, so, bye-bye. <laughs> um, so our next question from Luke says, this is such a great topic and so appreciates perspectives that you three have shared. Um, the question is, what did you do before or during the publishing process that you feel helped readers find your book? Is there some effort that you wish you had made beforehand? Um, so I had so many, you know, Alex, so many different avenues I could have taken when you asked the question about what did I wish I, what did I wish I had known before? Um, and one of those is that I needed to be a systems person. I'm not that. I am not Virgo-ish at all. <laughs> Um, I have to be to some degree, you know, at work during my day job, but in my creative life, I'm just much more, you know, fluid and artistic in my mind anyway. Um, and so I just, I'm just not the spreadsheet queen like some of my friends are, um, but I wish I were, I should have been because um, you need to be organized. Um, and, and, you know, having spreadsheets, I, I admire friends who have spreadsheets for their submissions, um, you know, so, so that when they send off a piece to wherever they know what the status is, if they've heard back from the editors, if it's a yes or no, if they're still waiting, um, if it's, you know, do they take simultaneous submissions, like really detailed spreadsheets you know, from the submission process. And then if I had been doing that kind of work um, while writing, then I think that would have transferred to the, the marketing of the book because I definitely needed spreadsheets for, for marketing. It's a lot of work. Um, I did hire a publicist for four months to work in tandem with Feminist Press, which is amazing. Um, but, you know, they have other books to to put to, to market and it's a small team, the mighty. Um, and I uh, consulted with a local uh, publicist who, and I just had such a, I'd met her once at a reading um, and I had such a good feel after we talked for about an hour, I liked the, the what she'd done for other local writers. She knows the local landscape. She's also an author. Um, and so I introduced her to Feminist Press once I decided, yes, this is what I'm avenue that I'm gonna go down. Um, and they were, they helped me get organized because they had their, you know, spreadsheets and they worked together. She, we met uh, once a week on Fridays and I had a notebook just for the marketing and publicity pieces, but I'm still not as organized as I'd like to be. So definitely something that I would definitely encourage is that you embrace the spreadsheet model from submissions to revisions to the marketing. <laughs> I, I wish I had had that advice too. Um, that definitely would have would have helped. Um, yeah, for me, I mean, I've been in a in an unusual position because um, you know this is my second debut, um, my second like go round as like a quote unquote debut author, um, and the first time in twenty fourteen um, with a very small press, I, like I did all of the publicity myself. Um, and I didn't do very much and some of it was effective and some of it was not, but, you know, like, I think the book did fairly well for, um, for what it was and the kind of distribution it got. Um, and, uh, and now, yeah, like I have this whole year, I've been like, I'm going to, I'm going to correct all of the things that went badly with that first go round. Um, you know, I had, a, I had, um, the novel Margaret and the Mystery of the Missing Body come out in September and then Slug just came out today. And for both of them, I was like, I'm gonna do all of this work, all of this labor. And I did do a lot of work, but like, it's not nearly as much work as I thought I was going to be doing. And um, it just like took so much out of me, even like the, like all of that admin stuff um, is just like not the kind of work I like doing. So I've been very grateful to um, Jisoo and the, and the team at Feminist Press for like, 
uh, for all of the all of the incredible work they do to support their books. Because uh, I'm just, you know, I just uh, that is not my. I'm just not good at it. So um, again, yeah, I have I to give you credit because you, you only mentioned half of your publications this year. I believe you've published uh, four books this year. It's, so it sounds like yeah. you've been working a lot. <laughs> yeah, no, so many emails. Um, yeah, it is a lot of work. So I guess my advice to you, Luke, is just give yourself the space and time to do that work because it's going to be a lot. Um, Luke, I'm going to put you on the spot. Luke has a book coming out with Feminist Press in a year's time, so it's about to get real. <laughs> Wisey, did you want to jump in on that, that question at all? Um, I think same as Megan. I, I have to admit, I'm not great. <laughs> I'm not great at um, the marketing aspect of publishing a book. Um, and yeah, you know, you can totally tell I'm not even like a <laughs> eloquent speaker. I, I try, I try. Um, but I think, yeah, some things you can do is um, get together, band together with other debut authors. Um, you can help, you know, if you're, you feel too squeamish about constantly promoting your own book, you can, um, you know, hang out with other debut authors and you promote their book and they will promote yours and sort of make it like a group um, group effort so that it feels, first of all, less like you're shouting <laughs> into the wind and two, it makes it a little more fun. Uh, it can be mortifying, but you know, you don't feel it as much when you're doing it with other people. Um, but, you know, please, I'm no expert. <laughs> Great, Thank congratulations you. on your forthcoming book. It's really exciting. Yes, Luke, congratulations. <laughs> so I think that the the general the general um, thread was spreadsheets so <laughs> and organization. So I think that's good. <laughs> Cassandra, did you want to jump in at all? I was just going to say starting. I think in the publicity world, it's something like what starts. So once you know your book is coming out, you're under contract something like six to nine months um, in terms of a rollout for marketing. And even if you're not hiring a publicist and certainly you know, not for that long, it's very expensive. Um, you can do that for yourself. You know, I, I really um, have a hard time asking people for things. I like to give, but it's hard. So knowing that you're gonna have to have blurbs, um, that was just mortifying despite that I knew a million authors. <laughs> um, but just, pre you know, starting early, one to give to, you know, it's already difficult for some of us to ask, but you wanna make sure that you're asking them and giving them a, enough lead time to read your, your manuscript, first of all, and then and, and to write about it. So um, I think that's, that's important. It's just the author questionnaire that Feminist Press sent me um, ended up being like nine pages, like all of the questions, things that I hadn't thought about, like all of the different contexts, just thinking about your network in a way that, um, you know, it's gonna, they're, they're happy to help you to, you know, bring your book to the world. You've done that, hopefully for them, and it's not tit for tat, but it's just, it's, it's a family. It's, it's, um, it's it's a wonderful thing to go to writers uh, readings and support their books and then to be just flooded with gratitude when they do the same for you. Um, so just always be working in advance, I would say. Yeah, Lauren, go for it. Yeah, I think, you know, we we work in phases and, you know, six months before pub, the pandemic has really changed a lot of these timelines too. So that's a part two panel now, <laughs> pandemic publishing. Um, but I think there's all of these opportunities for a long lead to engage your own network. So you're not like, I have a book coming out tomorrow. And you're like blasting out everyone in your network. So these like, there are these like touchstones over time. You're like planting seeds, you're laying a foundation to be like, hey, I have this book coming out. Hey. And then, you know, then you have a cover to share and then you have a little tour and then you have, you know, an excerpt here. And so you have these different touchstones leading up um, that way you can galvanize and build on your network so that by the time the book is actually out in stores everybody is in the know <laughs> wonderful thank you so much lauren um, so we do have to wrap up before we do does anybody have any sort of last minute um 
comments, just like one sentence that they might want to share. Um, it's okay if you don't, but I just want to give you like one last one last word if you have one. <laughs> I just Good looked luck. at my little. I'm sorry. <laughs> Sorry, you go ahead. I, was, I just looked at my notes and one thing that I wrote down that's a one-liner is marketing, book marketing is ongoing. So right. that's been a lesson for me. Okay, ongoing marketing. Uh, I would say this is the part of being a published author that I enjoy a lot, which is interviewing other writers. And you don't have to be a published author to do that. Um, you can interview other writers and find out you know, what they find um, inspiring about writing and what they take from it, how they approach their work. I think everyone has very different answers and it's uh, been really useful for me to see that and to really internalize like there's no one way to do this. Yeah, that's a great response. And I'll just add that reviews too, writing reviews of other authors' books, um, you will get boundless gratitude um, and, uh, and uh, that and that and another publishing credit. So um, that's something I really recommend. Excellent, Lauren. Any any last thoughts? Uh, last thoughts. I just want to plug everyone's books. Um, I have to say, like, thank you for everyone coming to the panel. Someone was asking how we can best support our writers. That's a, a great question to ask. You can do that by buying their books. So Megan has two books out with Feminist Press, Margaret and the Mystery of the Missing Body and Slug, which is out today. YZ has The Wake at Home and newest book, A Novel Edge Case. And Cassandra Lane's We Are Bridges came out earlier this year. We have links in the Q&A section. So check them out. Thank you so much, Lauren. Um, and thank you everybody for joining us today. Thank you authors for sharing your, your brilliant insights with us. Um, I reiterate Lauren, just we encourage you um, to support all of our authors um, here by buying their books at their favorite indie bookstores. Um, and like Lauren said, FB has that linked in the uh, chat. Um, and Feminist Press is a nonprofit indie press. Um, so they welcome donations to help continue to support the next generation of emerging feminist writers to help publish their de debuts and build their writing careers. Those links are also should be in the Q&A. <laughs> so thank you all so much for joining us um, and for coming to the first ever panel for the uh, Young Feminist Leadership Council. Um, and have a great evening. Awesome. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Fun. What a great conversation. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank Bye. You. Bye.